we don't have that luxury now of having some major economy in the world doing well. So if they are having the difficulties that we're seeing and they are real and are going to stay that way, plus with us slowing down and Europe just still mirrored in, in, in an economic uh, significant downturn, including Japan, it's very hard to make an argument that strong economies can abound in the next couple of years. And with that, so should stock markets. That's why I think general exposure to general equities at this point in time just don't seem prudent. Job growth may be slower than it seems on paper. And of course, uh, the labor market may not be as strong overall. We're talking about the strength of the economy and where the stock markets are headed next with our next guest, Peter Grandich, founder of Peter Grandich and Company. Welcome back to the show, Peter. Always an honor hosting you. Thank you for being here. Always an honor to be your guest. Thank you. Let's start by talking about the equity markets first. You were telling me offline how you think the peak may already be in, and indeed you were calling for lower prices to come. Uh, they have come, Peter. They've uh, The stock markets, the S&P, the NASDAQ, have peaked around late July. What's next, do you think? Well, my argument has been basically in 2022 to get out. For those that weren't out in 2023, there'd be a rebound that if you still find yourself too extended as many people did in 2022, used that rally to uh, lessen. And I think that rally has come and is really basically finished. I think we've uh, pretty certain seen the highs, uh, unless the Fed does something very unusually and suddenly makes a major reversal, which I don't think is coming. Uh, and I think uh, we're gonna continue to get used to, it's gonna be tough for a lot of people, but sub, standard returns that were not expected by people, but people grew accustomed to over the last couple of decades of double digit returns. I think at best stock markets will leak out small single digit returns a few years and then a few other years give that back. I don't really have any opportunity to see large scale increases in the equity markets as far out as my eyes can still see. I think that's the theme of our discussion today is wealth preservation and uh, particularly for your business, how to plan for retirement. So these are themes that uh, everyone needs to plan for and think about at some point in their lives. So we'll, we'll talk about that today. Um, going back to the stock markets, Peter, the the retracement that we've seen over the last month or so, uh, what was that caused by? A shift in perception and strength of the economy, or is that just taking profits? Well, I think some of it is obviously taking profits. I, I think, again, we don't often speak about it, David, and I think because we get too caught up in the way the market is now, but this stock market is nothing what it once was 20, 30, even 40 years ago when I started. It's dominated by machine-driven or computer-type programs. Uh, very few of them are interested in what the market once was, a place to become part ownerships of businesses. It's really a sophisticated, uh, algorithm-driven uh, programs that uh, – move markets on a daily basis. And because how that is, when they get overextended one way, they sell off and vice versa higher. But over a long period of time, economies and interest rates and all the things that once played a primary role will take hold. And I, and I think that's where we're at now, that much of the movement that has been able to be achieved by uh, sophisticated computer-driven programming is behind us and now the realities of a, of a weakening economy huge problems on the political and social front and 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 and, and a geopolitical items now that people weren't even thinking about a few years ago mainly the BRICS and other things happening around the world all of these things i think will keep a lid on gains that people grew accustomed to over the last few decades okay uh, but these computers, they've made trading more efficient it, it, or, or, or less? Well, I don't, it, efficient, I don't mean in terms of, you mean in terms of how fast you can get an execution? Yes. I mean, it's microseconds. Has it made the market more of a casino-like atmosphere where, where things trade, uh, where certain groups have a much bigger advantage? Most definitely. I, 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 think a pu I think a public trader going in and thinking they can sit at their computer and even offer graphs and charts and all as we once were, you're playing with pea shooters and the people that are 
playing with the big guns, uh, have nuclear weapons. So I, from a trading standpoint, uh, it always was difficult to beat the market trading. I think that's basically an impossibility now if you think you're, an individual can do it by simply sitting in front of a computer screen. Speaking of the evolution of trading, when you first started in the business decades ago, how has your approach to buying and trading and selling stocks differed over the years from when you first started to the Peter Granich we know today? Well, the Peter Granich that got started, I don't even understood how he survived. I mean, in the first three years of my career, I made a forecast of a crash and, and an eventual rebound. And to this day, I can't imagine I had the educational wherewithal to make that call, but for whatever reason I did, I would say the difference now is I've learned to be a better loser. And I think that's a thing that still is missing among financial advisors. And that is the fact that losing is a part of this business. And what I really learned is what separates us from making money versus losing money is not how much we make, but how much we prevent ourselves from losing during difficult periods, which I think this is one of them. And so I, I err on the side of caution and I have a standard a uh, line that I share, and that is it's just better to be a live chicken versus a dead duck, which mis simply means this is not a time to be more aggressive. This is a time to be less aggressive. But when you say you're a better loser, can you expand on that? Does that mean you've, you've hedged yourself better? You, you just take fewer risky positions? Like what, what, what do you do to be able to take losses better now? Well, some of the problems, one of the big things that gets in the way of both investors and financial advisors in particular is hubris. Uh, we At one time, I believed the headlines that used to come out almost daily about the Wall Street whiz kid, which was my nickname. And of course, if the market went against my views, it was the market that was wrong. It wasn't me. But when you see a bank account drop six or seven figures, you start to realize maybe it isn't the market, it is you. And so I, when I say I'm a better loser is I've accepted that losing is part of it and that I need to... Uh, cut losses where things I might have held on to beforehand simply because my ego got in the way. Uh, one thing I'll just tell you this, David, after 40 years, anybody that's going to try to make a living looking into a crystal ball, you better learn how to eat a lot of broken glass. And that means you got to learn to be wrong. And we're, and we're not just going to continuously be right and always get each market on the right side. It's difficult to cut losses. Many of the traders I've talked to have said that it's difficult because you've got your emotions in the way. You think you're down and you want to recoup your losses and you think that just staying in there a bit longer will get you back up because eventually things rebound. Something Is that is that the correct mentality or no? You know, well, the ultimate crime I've con concluded after 40 years is not being wrong. It's staying wrong. And... Uh, when you're also competing to be in the media, and don't get me wrong, I, it's a blessing that people like yourself have me on. I consider it an honor, not that I'm deserving of it. But I also start to think as we get too caught up in what we think other people are going to think if we make a, a move or change our moves. And, and I think you have to learn that words like if, but, perhaps, maybe can't be part of your viewpoints. You have to make a stand. And when the stand proves wrong, you have to admit it and move on and and understand this, most times these are not, they're not boats. They're not going to sail without you. They're ferries. If some opportunity sails, another opportunity is going to come in. So uh, I think we have to learn to have patience in this business. And if I say one thing I've learned is instead of counting to 10 when you get upset or something hasn't worked out, count to 100. And by then, your egos and all the other stuff moves out of the way and, and common sense normally returns. I think that's a good life lesson as well. When I started my career um, <laughs> out of college, I studied finance. I wanted to be an investment banker. I wanted to go into asset management. I, I realized very quickly I wasn't good at any of that. So that's why I'm asking questions now to fund managers. But I enjoy doing what I do, and that's because I gave up on my, on my, on my first dream. Um, but going back to trading, Peter, how do you know when you've got a losing position? Suppose you're down a little bit. Maybe the market's just had a bad week, but maybe your thesis is still correct. But how do you know that maybe your thesis is wrong and you've got to cut your losses? Well, if you're honest with yourself, I, you know, I always used to say this, when, especially when I spoke publicly. People would always say, hey, you guys on Wall Street and gals, you, you tell us when to buy, but you never tell us when to sell or you, you tell us when it's too late. I think one of the first attitudes you have to have is, could I, based on what I now know today, 
make the same commitment that my currently my investment has. And once you start to hesitate and you don't have that same hard nose, can't, you know, it's got to work feeling, that's your first indication. And then, of course, what happens is we, we let emotions, we also get concerned. As I said, one of the things when you're on this side of the ledger, when you're when you're a so-called authority and, you know, people looking at, you know, you let, well, what are people going to think if I switch? A lot of times advisors don't switch because they feel, oh, my God, if I switch and it goes the other way, forget about it. Nobody will uh, ever want to listen to me. And we ride out our views too long. I, I really think you have to take each day and start anew and see if everything that you originally purchased or thought why you should be in that still exists. And the moment when you're honest to yourself and say, wait, a lot of those things don't exist, that's a real indication of thinking maybe you have to change course. All right. So have a disciplined approach. Now, let's talk about your views. You've been pretty consistent with how the economy is not doing so well um, throughout the year, actually. So you, you've stuck to your thesis despite an initial rally in the stock markets. Now, one of the things you've been talking about is weakness in the labor market under the hood. Now, I'm just going to read two paragraphs of this article here. Uh, U.S. job growth during much of the past year was weaker than previously projected by a little more than 300,000 jobs, according to new federal data released Wednesday this week. As part of the agency's annual re benchmark review of payroll data, the Bureau of Labor Statistics revised down March 2023's employment uh, gains by 306,000 positions. So uh, this comes as today's ADP data came out and uh, 177,000 jobs were added in August. This was well below the revised total of 371,000 jobs added in July. So we've got new job creation slowing down a little bit on a month to month basis. And of course, we have to talk about these giant revisions downward. What do you think is really happening in the labor market? Well, my argument since the January numbers started coming out was that the BLS was fudging uh, purposely or accidentally or a combination of both on a thing that they still pretty well keep secret, which is what they call their birth death model. And, uh, and it was exaggerating uh, the increases in payroll. And the government was using that to create a, 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 an argument that they were in a turn making the economy better when in fact it really wasn't getting better. And uh, basically the BLS, uh, the Bureau of Label Statistics has basically come out and basically thrown in the towel on much of this past year and greatly adjusted it. And I think there'll even be more adjustments. But what's really interesting in that, David, is it wasn't just for labor numbers. It's been with industrial production, housing stocks, they're revising all of those sharply lower than originally. And that just begs the conspiracy thinking that this has all been on a purpose mode because to, to try to create an ore that was really not there to begin with. And I just think that with that realization and the understanding and all the other things that we're married in, uh, we're going to see uh, some sort of recession, uh, soft, middle, hard, it's still left up in the air. I don't think anybody can stick their neck out and bet everything they have on one of them. But things are going to be a lot slower. And when you have that and you still have a stickiness in interest rates, because the other talk that's not getting a lot of coverage is the incredible amount of increase of need for borrowing. It, the CBO has come out and said basically every day we're going to be, need to, $5.3 billion more to keep living on the on the path we're living at. We borrowed a trillion dollars in, in the T-bill market this past, for just this calendar year. And they argue we may still need to borrow another 600 billion to finish out the year uh, just to keep going. And when you think about that in a market that's no longer rip roaring, the bond market is certainly not in a major bull market anymore. Interest rates are going to remain sticky high, even if we do see a dramatic slowdown in interest rates. And this comes at a time when the, both the dollar and, and the world's view on the U.S. as a, as the only place and the only game in town is, is dissipating. As I've told you, the BRIC movement, while not earth shattering at the moment, is just another indication that the time of America's 
as the number one empire and, and the world's strongest economy and all the other things that like to be said about that is dissipating, all that's going to play a role in our own economy and what our interest rates do. Mm. Speaking of other economies, weakness in China is a concern to many investors who think that this weakness may be imported. I'm talking about deflation. I'm talking about uh, youth unemployment being so high they stopped reporting these numbers. And in fact, China stopped reporting a lot of data series. Um, and now uh, Jake Sullivan, uh, U.S. Uh, security national security advisor, has actually said that China should be more transparent with its data reporting. There's a lot of weakness in China right now. Um, for a lot of reasons. How is this going to impact American investors, you think? Well, I would tell Jake, good luck on getting them to be more transparent. They haven't been for a lot of years, and I don't expect anything is going to change for them in that regard. Uh, about, say, six to eight weeks ago, my caution is grew because of what we were at least seeing out of China. And I'll say then what I still say now, and that is how the China economy goes over the next several months is going to play a significant role how the world economy goes. And right now, they at least have serious challenges. Some may be more difficult than others. And they are trying to address it. They are taking what some people feel are needed actions. But the net net result is that we also have to accept that China is just not going to grow at the levels that it once grew at and how that aided the world. So uh, I, I would not count on, and, and let's not forget this, if it wasn't for China's economic strength and ability and, and ability to finance, the 2008 financial crisis would have been a lot worse. We don't have that luxury now of having some major economy in the world doing well. So if they are having the difficulties that we're seeing and they are real and are gonna stay that way, Plus, with us slowing down and Europe just still mirrored in, in, in an economic uh, significant downturn, including Japan, it's very hard to make an argument that strong economies can abound in the next couple of years. And with that, so should stock markets. That's why I think general exposure to general equities at this point in time just don't seem prudent. I know you've liked commodities in the past. You probably still do. But this China narrative that played out over the summer, uh, their central bank cutting rates unexpectedly in light of weakness, does that change your narrative on commodities? Keeping in mind that China is one of the world's, if not the world's largest user of base metals. Well, well, let's understand that they're, they're not going into negative growth, okay? So there's, there's still growth a foot. It may not be to levels that people expected or anticipated. But one of the problems for those who want to get very bearish on commodities is there's not a lot of excess supply this time around. Uh, there's great argument, even not taking into account of the greening and where people expect growth over the next 10 years. A lot of commodities, uh, key commodities and base metals, uh, don't have large scale excess supply anywhere or can come onto the market anytime soon. And so I don't think there's any reason to ratchet down expectations that some of us like me who have for copper, uh, for zinc uh, and others, just because China may be going into a much slower growth period. But I also know that if governments are gonna stick to this greening uh, desire, which seems to be that many governments, especially right now, the United States has the floor to the, the pedal to the floor, then the commodity argument really hasn't changed. And that, you know, given where they're selling at and the valuations you can see in companies that are associated with them are far more attractive than some of the things you may find in the technology where their valuations, uh, in fact, Hedge funds now own the most exposure ever in the history of the U.S. towards large mega com uh, computer based, you know, technology companies. And that's just not a time where I think the public should be getting in. That should be a warning about getting out. I, I'm assuming then you think that this particular sector that you just talked about will outperform the rest of the index because you are bearish on the rest of the index. Yeah, I, I, I sometimes you your choice is not so much what you like, but a lesser of two evils. Okay, I understand. And, <laughs> and 
I certainly, if one versus another, anything that's dear to me, my wife, my daughter, and you said to me, Pete, you get one back. Stocks are higher over the next year or lose less than commodities or, or commodities. Uh, commodities in general would be a much uh, safer bet for my sake. Is there, um, now, the, the green movement aside, is there a commodity that you think will do well in the shorter to medium term, either due to supply uh, demand it, fundamentals not adding up or a surge in demand? Yeah. For the last two, three years, I've argued and, and kept one core position saying it would uh, just continue doing well with that metal as well, and that's uranium and chemical. The If there's one commodity that seems to have the least risk of loss of principal, barring something totally unforeseen, which would be in this case, a, you know, a terrible accident, uh, uranium and uranium prices should only work higher. And with that, and because those uranium prices were going higher, the reason I kept saying focus on chemical and not some of the more junior exploration companies is institutions who are not going to be able to buy those juniors, but still going to want exposure are not going to, their, their, their choices are counted on one hand. And so the couple of companies that exist that own physical uranium and purchase physical uranium or a producer like Cameco was only going to work higher if we were right about the uranium price. And I said that the uranium price doesn't have to skyrocket for those to make money. And uh, I, I still think that that's still something we're, we're moving forward to. The reversal is 180 degrees. I, I, I like to use this description, David. If we went to a senator 10 or 15 years ago in any state and said, hey, we'd like to really build a nuclear plant, they, the answer would have been not in my state. Now those same senator goes, please, can you build one and build one fast? Because they realize how much need there's going to be for power, electrical power, and we're not in the position to, to meet all that demand. So uranium would be the one that I would say has the least risk of all, all the metals and all the commodities that are out there right now. Well, your uranium call from a few years ago has played out beautifully. It's up 100% since March 2020. So it's now trading at 58 dollars a pound it was 26 so i'm gonna ask it's up 100 percent. why do you think it still has upside it's already skyrocketed because we're not yet at a price which is going to drive a much increase to look for and develop uh more uranium product at a time when the need for it to even service the current power plants that need uranium let alone all the ones that are being planned and built coming online and we're also seeing that some of the things that were kind of sold as sure things and don't worry about nuclear power aren't working out to the levels that they thought, wind, solar. So you have to believe, if you're gonna believe in anything of an increased electrical demand coming over the years, that nuclear energy is gonna to have to play a vital role in that. So my target back then it was hard for people to imagine you know chemical was under 10 and uranium was actually under 20 and i said that a 75 dollar uranium price i think we're going to have to get to before there's any real incentive for people to start spending large scale and you know develop some of these juniors that hopefully may have a deposit or two and with that companies like chemical were just going to make oodles of money and and its previous high of 50 something dollars it was my ultimate target. And that was kind of crazy thinking when it's under 10, but now I don't think it's as crazy looking. And I think it has still that upside potential. Uh, what is the um, production price that companies like Cameco need to break even? Well, there's a great debate on that, uh, depending where you are, uh, depending on what your expectations are, where known supply is now the important thing to keep in mind about uranium that i you know people spend too much time on it and there's too much intraday talk about it these things this is a turtle kind of a race it takes a long time to develop but a lot of areas where people would hope you could find if we need a lot more are not the safest or places we can count on it's not something that's sitting in a lot of friendly areas of the world that would be very beneficial to the U.S. And I talk as a U.S. citizen. Obviously, our good friends like you to the north 
are. But when you start to look at other areas of the world, some places in Africa and Russia and, and some of the former Soviet Union states, that's what keeps the bullish undertone, I think, and why prices can only work higher. All right. Okay, so for the final segment of our conversation, let's pivot to talking about retirement planning. This is one of your core businesses. Peter, let's start with this. At what age should a person start being concerned about planning for retirement? Let's put it that way. The day they first start working, Dave, and unfortunately, in a world that got too caught up in living for today, many people wait until it's too late. That's why 65% of Americans right now are working paycheck to paycheck and have little or no savings for retirement. In fact, almost two thirds of them now don't have the ability to come up with a thousand dollars if there's an emergency. That's how really struggling the real facts are in the United States of America. Now, when you when you take into account that, and that is not something that's going to change overnight, and we still see wages uh, less than the cost of inflation those people are only going to be under more of a struggle. So there's not going to be a turnaround about that group that suddenly they're going to have excess capital and be able to make up for lost time. But realistically, now here's the challenge. And it was probably something I heard and didn't want to listen to either when I was 30 or 40 years younger than I am now. And that is less is more. We, 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 we become, compared to our parents and grandparents, so talk about 50 to 100 years ago, our grandparents didn't need places like public storage to keep stuff. They lived in smaller dwellings. They didn't have as many items. And we, that's one of the reasons why America was once the largest creditor nation. We had excess savings, but we, we gave up a lot of saving for the future in, in, in order to live a better lifestyle or a higher lifestyle than our finances currently support. And that's been caught up for a whole bunch of social and economic reasons that you don't have you don't have enough time on your show to get into. But the bottom line, David, is that that challenge is going to cause a lot of hardships going forward because we have an aging community. We have an aging uh, society. That society, they are going to not be able to. I can just trust me at 67. It's not as easy to do things as it was when it was 37. And yet. A lot of people into their 60s, 70s, and maybe in the 80s, if they live that long, are going to have to work. And then something else comes in, involved, and, and, and it opens up a, a Pandora's box that most people don't even want to talk about. A, because we're living longer than previous generations, we're now facing illnesses and challenges that just didn't happen to us. When you were only living to 60, things like dementia and other type of diseases that take hold at, at an older age. But the real challenge is going to be this, Dave. When does that young 30, 35 year old worker who's getting higher and higher taxes to support things like Medicare and Medicaid for people older and older go, wait a minute, I, I can't even survive on my own. Listen, these 85 year old people, they can't have a half million dollar operations just so they can live a couple more years. And then that 85 year old person goes, well, wait a minute, you took all this money out for all these years. I want to be able to have this. We're eventually going to face a battle of the ages um, that will put demographics front and center. It's not something that's happening tomorrow, but it's certainly within your lifetime. And that's going to be, open up a, a, a huge, huge social, uh, political and economic. And politics will always fall on the side of whoever has the money, because where power comes from is people that have money to support those who have the power. And that is a that's a that's a thing that maybe isn't for a discussion today, but if you are planning out past the next year or two, it's important. And one other thing, David, the CBO says in eight years, we're gonna owe $50 trillion as a country. I always ask every financial advisor, whether they're 25 years old or 75 years old, please explain to me and your clients how at $50 trillion and a, just a 5% interest rate, how does this country manage to just pay for the ex the interest costs, and let alone continue as a country to support us as citizens. To me, it seems as an impossibility. So somewhere in the next five to 10 years, I believe we're going to come to a crisis unlike anything we've ever seen before. And David, before anybody goes, well, he must profit them somehow. Yes, if I was selling dry food, 
homes, or even gold, maybe I would profit from it. But in my planning business, there's no profitability for me sharing that other than, in a sense, sharing what I think is coming, and people can decide whether or not they want to accept it and prepare for it. There's another phenomenon, which is that a lot of countries around the world are raising their retirement age. In fact, the OECD projects that 20 out of the 38 OECD countries will be raising their retirement ages over the coming years. Suppose this were to happen in, let's say, let's just take the United States. It already happened around the other countries around the world, but let's just take the United States, for example. Your retirement age goes up from, I don't know, 65 to 70. Then you've got to work longer uh, in your life to be able to get to an age where you get pensions and social security and all that. Uh, does that change the planning method at all? Does that change your outlook for your career? Oh, it most definitely does. You know, let's understand here in America, the reason 65 was the number, and that's why I came up with Social Security, because most people at that time when Social Security started wasn't living past that. That's why they never even thought about, what well, we should invest this money because someday people are going to live longer. Uh, I, I think the thing that you're going to have to understand is, is that you have this comes a conscious decision and sometimes faith comes involved in it. Do you want to kill yourself for 70 to 75 percent of your life so your last 20, 25 percent can be in some relative comfort compared to what what may others be and all? And that's going to be an argument. Countries that are already getting closer to that challenge than even the United States is a country like Japan, where much sooner than us, there are going to be more people retired than possibly that the current workforce can support. And decisions are going to have to be made as how do we keep going this way? And are people going to be willing to be taxed and work longer so an older generation can somehow survive? It, it's a topic I can trust me that not only politicians don't want to speak about, but the financial community doesn't want to speak about. I do. Uh, I guess only because I, I feel I'm led to speak about it. And at the same time is I can put my head on the pillow and know at least I shared something that maybe people don't want to hear, but they should. All right. So you don't have to go into details if you don't want, but maybe give us an outline of how a person, a working person should prepare for his or her retirement. When he starts first starts working, you say they should start preparing for when they first start working. Um, relative to their income, how much money should they put aside into where and whether or not this changes throughout his life? Well, you, the first thing people don't do at all walks, and I worked with athletes that sometimes are making 50 or $100 million, and I told them the same thing. You need to first see how you're spending money. And the only way you're going to know that is for 30 or 60 days, just track it. Write down whatever you spend money for. First thing is people find out they're spending money that they didn't even realize they were spending. Second, and this is, a, this is only a decision, Dave, someone like you can make. I say to you, David. Do you need everything you have or think what you think you need to have in order to get where you are? Some people say, hey, I just need a car to get from point A to B. Some other people at the same age making the same money and goals, if I'm going from A to B, I want to go in style and I want everybody looking to know I'm in style. Well, those are all personal decisions and all. I'm just going to tell you this. It's going to be far more challenging in the coming years uh, than ever before because of all the sins of the past. The, the unfortunateness for the next generation or two, the previous generations, including us boomers, weren't conscientious in the way that we should have been. And unfortunately, it's not we're not just going to suffer from it, but it's our, our children and our grandchildren that will as well. Haven't you made a case, though, Peter, for, I'm just playing devil's advocate, for the fact that we're now, we now have higher living standards than our parents and grandparents? I mean, you say you're your parents' generation, they lived in smaller houses. They didn't have storage for their things. Well, we have more things now. We have bigger houses. We have fancier cars. People can, you know, access credit at a, low, a younger age, this and that. Isn't that, doesn't that mean our lives are better off? My, my dear friend, David, <laughs> the question to answer, to respond to that is, are you really mentally better off? And what studies will show you is, more people are under stress, more people are suffering health issues because of all those things or striving for those things to have. And I, I think anybody that's been old enough and remembers grandpa and grandma and Uncle Tom, or whoever may have been living with you and all, there was a much sense of peace and, and less stress than 
what our current generation is under the, under now. And uh, part of that is why people are finally, in some instances, saying, hey, you know, we're, we're moving too fast. We need to slow down. And uh, some changes have to come in, 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 in our lifestyles. Unfortunately, there's not enough of those people. And there's still a major issue of governments living way beyond the means. That's why the indebtedness of just not the United States, but Canada and most of the Western world is going to be a penalty for those that are going to have to be around to service that debt. All right. So let's let's suppose my friends who are in their 30s listen to this interview. I hope they do. And they learn something from Peter Granich. And they and they go home and they think, all right, I don't I don't need all that stuff. Let me put some of it away for retirement. What do they do? Do they put that cash in a bank account? Do they put it in a GIC, a mutual fund? Do they put it in gold commodities? What, what do they do? Leave it there for 20 years. Well, not I, I'm not a cookie gutter person, but I think that if they can streamline and see and have excess money, uh, you still need to invest with something with growth. But let me just end it with telling you from all the years of dealing with people, where did that money come from, the people that I saw? Well, the first is they inherited it. They weren't the ones that made it. Somebody made it before them and it's been passed on. The second is small to mid-sized business owners. The third is commercial real estate, which may have an asterisk now because commercial real estate is changing somewhat. If you're involved in office and big buildings, not exactly the great place where BlackRock and the vanguards are all going by buying homes and then renting them out because more people are going to be able to rent versus buy. That's a growth area. Where they made it in investing is either they worked on Wall Street and sold financial investments or they worked for public companies where they were granted uh, stock options and all. I've only met a handful of people that said to me over the years, yeah, mom and dad put away a few thousand each year in the markets and they walked away with a couple million. It's still a very challenging environment to put risk capital in for other people to make your money. When you can control your own destiny or influence it versus strictly turning it over to somebody and hope, hope that they have do well with it. Uh, if you can control your own destiny or make it on your own sweat versus hopefully somebody's other sweat and brow is going to achieve it for you so much the better. So my advice to them is if you can work for yourself like a young man I'm looking at and build your own business versus going in and punch a clock and then hopefully you have something left over the day, that's where I would tell people and, and entrepreneurship and, and, and using your hands and your brains, uh, I think is much better than hoping just some financial product or service or somebody in that world is going to turn one dollar into two, three, or four for you. How do you feel about four hundred one k's? There's these two extremes of viewing four hundred one k's. They're you know the godsend for retirees, or they're a scam. Are you in between? Are you in either camp? I, I'm in in between. In our work, uh, we don't mind them, but we find that people again. Uh, if they invest in themselves and have an ability to do that, uh, maximize there before they start to put excess. One of the reasons 401ks were created, my view, and I've had this view for a couple of decades, was to remove corporations to be re responsible for pensioners and things of that nature. And unfortunately, uh, 401ks became more, for, for some people, an avenue of to really speculate slash gambling that shouldn't have been done. It should have been limited. And while the market was going up, it was great. But now people like last year who saw the average retirement uh, plan fall almost 24, 25%, where a pension wouldn't have done that, where somebody was just managing and would have been protected for principal. That's the downside for my argument for 401ks. Excellent. Final question. You've worked with professional athletes. We hear uh, we hear of athletes making eight figures, nine figures in some cases. Some of them have even gone broke. And the first instinct or first reaction we have is how is that possible to go bankrupt on that kind of a salary? Have you witnessed that? What are, what are some of the mistakes they've made that maybe we can learn from? Well, let's take the NFL where predominantly our clients, well, my, my partner who was a uh, 
a running back on the first two Giants Super Bowl team, used to tell him that the NFL stands for not for long. And until recently, uh, contracts weren't guaranteed in the NFL. Now, like other major sports, they are. And uh, so they were one injury away from uh, accident. What we try to explain to them that wanted to listen, because you got to remember some of these young kids, especially that's one of the reasons I kind of left other than the social reasons, because they started to look at me as a grandpa and, and grandpa's okay to sit down and have a cup of coffee with, but I don't want to listen to some old guy telling me what to do, came the attitude. But I would explain to them that right now, even the undrafted free agent who's signing a minimum contract in the NFL, Today, if I was sitting with him, I'd be still saying, even though it doesn't look like a lot compared to that guy over there that just got $35 million guaranteed, you're still in the top 1% to 2% income earners in the world. But that's not going to last. You're not going to play into your 50s or 60s. And so you need to start focusing on what are you going to do after. Now, the NFL has probably done the best job of the four major sports in providing training now. Every team has a player development person, which means his or her job is to work with the current players on what are you going to do after your career. That didn't even exist 15, 20 years ago. But the biggest problem, Dave, and the stories I could tell you one day you can do hours, shows worth of it is many times they get caught up in things by family. I can't tell you how many have lost money because second and third cousins show up tell them how much they always loved them since they were a kid and come up with some way of investing or speculating or businesses of that nature. And understand this, these are still pretty well young people, many times being handed tens of twenties or fifties of millions of dollars in the 21, 22 and 23. And even you now can know the difference of how more mature you are now than you were 10 years ago when you were 20 or whatever and all. And so they don't have the proper guidance. And most times they have yes people surrounding them, including their agents. That's how they get into those troubles. And so a lot of times when we spoke to them, they ran down to the next financial person because we were telling them to be conservative and careful. And the other one was telling them, hey, enjoy everything you got. It's a great time. And, and that's how they end up, unfortunately. Uh, and it, and it's, it's an amazing thing that still happens today despite all the better educated and surroundings that players had than they had 20 or 30 years ago. Where, where can we um, learn more about your work and uh, find out more about what you do? Well, I'm spending a lot of time on Twitter, according to my wife, too much time. So, but I do spend a lot of time speaking my thoughts on Twitter. Uh, I have a blog and I have a YouTube channel. Everything is just Peter Granich and, uh, Thankfully, people like yourself still find a reason to have me on once in a while, and I get to share my thoughts. Well, thankfully, people like yourself find time to speak with us and my audience. We're all better off for it. So thank you very much, Peter, for spending time with us. Appreciate it. Always a pleasure. God bless, Dave. And thank you for watching. Don't forget to subscribe and follow Peter down in the links below.